so we have demos today um, we have demos today so status we'll do first we'll have demos from Plasma if, if you're okay with that Jasmine yeah it's fine good then from David a demo we've been waiting for weeks if not months but we are happy that we have something we don't care about how long it takes as long as we have something and 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 uh, who else has demos Um, topics if anyone has topics questions so status 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 so up the PR on this one. Let's see. So we made one PR, we made one PR, delete obsolete profile images. The idea is that when you delete um, a media, then it, this PR will also delete all the profiles that you might have uh, created. Well, all the profile for all the profile images um, for the delete image. So it, it's not served anymore. That's the idea. And that's it. Gabor, ping Benedek, tell him that we need him. Um, Adios. Thank you. <laughs> um, then, Orchard Call. This is dev branch on the left and it should be clean. Okay, so I will keep everything I won't filter. So we have on the dev branch uh, collapse fixes. So fixing the collapse feature which lets us um, remove a level of identifiers in the GraphQL queries when not necessary. Layer rule based on the current culture from Gabor, is that your first PR, Gabor? No, it isn't. I have worked on the OpenID module oh. about rules. Thank. You. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. And big improvements on the OpenID. Good. Um, so the layer rule based on the culture, current culture. So the idea here is that we have a new method in the layers by default, which is called culture, and um, and 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 um, it it will filter the widgets if the culture that you pass as a parameter is the one uh, currently used in the current request. Okay, and it will also handle the um, culture prefix. Like if you search for um, fr and it's fr dash ca, it will match. Uh, I. See the documentation that yeah we created an issue to say that we need to document all these default filters at least because they are not so good job so this is this will allow for injecting widgets uh, using layers for specific culture so some people have started working on culture and localization that's good uh, manage culture admin page so this is just um, typos I think. Oh, and fixing the breadcrumb here. We space it. Mm -hmm. Then, Antoine again, use accepted values for resized image. Uh, as we noted last week, we were not using the correct values for the thumbnails in agency and also in the admin for the media page. So, the media page in the admin was not actually. Uh, correctly resizing the the assets so we were downloading the full images all the time now it's fixed 
Uh, fixing also the agency, so the agency, the media set, that's good. Then fixed that media model is not shown when trembling is full screen. Bug that if you had the editor, the, um, the HTML editor in full screen, you could not see the pop-up for the media items. So Matthias fixed that. Matthias is back. Uh, missing references and cleanups. Uh, this is because some projects were missing some references to tag helper like resource management tag helper. It will work in dev mode because apparently everything is loaded dynamically and that fixes all the issues with references. But when you will deploy, you will have issues. So try to refix that and also remove the files that we don't need anymore. Uh, and removed also all the tag helper injections that we don't need. So cleaning all the things, good job. Um, updating your SQL and you will see that more times after that. So this one was for what? This one, did I explain why? Nope. Oh, fixes two issues. Uh, these issues, what are they? Oh, this is for um, GraphQL. Okay. No, this is not for GraphQL, is it? Let me check. So, new SQL version. But for GraphQL, there was another issue. I don't know. Is it the new ID generation? Probably. Yes, that's the new ID generation. Um, so apparently it's new this week. So the idea is that when we use the SQL, when we save a document, the ID of the document is generated on the client side. Meaning when we call save, then we get a new ID. And this ID has to be unique for database. Um, there was only one strategy to do that, using the high-low uh, algorithm. But um, for SQLite, that, that was problematic. So I changed that by using customized and customizable uh, logic. For SQLite, it's using um, the default ID generator, which is just a static in-memory increment. Because with SQLite, we can just run with one node, so it makes sense to optimize the rest to be also um, adapted to this mode. So this is default. So there is no database access to generate an ID. But for the other servers, it's using the block ID generator, which was the previous logic, the def previous default logic, which is um, leasing a range of IDs, like 20 by default, from 1 to 20, and then from 21 to 40, and so on. And each client gets a lease, so ha will have a unique um, a set of attributed IDs, and another node might have another range. And that's how it's handled. And when, when you have created 20 items with your client, then it will issue a new request to the database to lease a new range that other nodes won't be able to lease. So that's the default behavior, but for services, well, RDBMSs that work as services, like SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL. And for SQLite, it's, the, it's a simple implementation. And I think that's it, some other minor changes in the API. So that was the first update on SQL. The idea was to prevent some looking issues that we find um, that mostly uh, Jérôme Pico has found with workflow definition, but then we found more issues later. So we'll see more updates on SQL. Updating the net version on Travis. Um, so this one is that yeah, it started to fail with this version. Apparently, it's not available anymore. I don't know why, so I updated to the latest one. Okay, and how it works on Travis is that we download this file. You see, donate install.sh, super useful utility. I use it a lot for my work. Um, so there is a .sh and a .ps1. Either you're on the shell, on bash, or on um, PowerShell. So you do that, and then you can install any version of .NET you want from a script. You don't have to download anything, just run this script, which is available on GitHub, and you specify which version you want, and you get the version. 
Okay. In this case, it's the SDK version, which will download both ASP.NET, the runtime, and the, and the CLI. Um, then adding Visual Studio extension and training the module reference to index from Mark uh, Marta from Lombic. So after our meeting last week, where I showed the well, where I, I assume um, it was Zoltan who explained what the Orchard training module was, and also we had a demo from Mark two weeks ago about the. Um, the new extension in Visual Studio, the new plugin. So you updated the README to point to these elements. Uh, change resize mode to max or model in the agency. So little uh, fix from Antoine to fix the theme based on which kind of transformation we want for the thumbnails on the agency. Antoine, did you update uh, tryorchard.net? I try Orchard Project. So if I create a new one, I will get the, the nice thumbnails. Yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, fix concurrent execution of fields resolution. This is for Carl because because he was seeing some. Well, no, it was not locking issues. It was. Um, what was the issue? Your message. It was interesting. So your message was that. So first, he's accessing GraphQL. Okay. Oh, he's got GraphQL query with content picker field. And when he's resolving content items with content picker fields, so which reference uh, other content items, he had issues like does not support multiple active record set. Okay, I could repro his issue with that thing. Item with the same key, but it was fixed in the meantime. Okay, well, the issue was that apparently Mars, it was a Mars issue, multiple active result sets. And this happens when you try to send multiple connect multiple transactions to create multiple transactions with the same connection. And then SQL Server will tell you, oh, we support that, but you have to enable Mars. But we don't by default. So it's typical from uh, this scenario. And this fix. This commit fixes it. The issue was was in um, GraphQL.net. It's not an issue. It's a default behavior that it's not that is not adapted to what we are doing. Um, the concern is that when we do a query on um, content items, so we'll get let's say ten results, ten content items. Each of these will have a field of type content field, content field picker. And the content, field, the content field picker field, oh, let me show you his query here. You see, we do a test type, display text, and here linked is the name of content field pickers. And we say, give me all the content items that are linked for this content item, and then display text. Um, so at that point, when GraphQL uh, wants to load the content items, there is a lambda in the type content field picker in this thing. Okay, thank you for the link because here you will see there is a lambda. So when the content items property is accessed for this field, then it will issue this code here, which is a query. It says, okay, query all the content items which are related to this content item. And that is where the issue happened. And the issue happened because multiple um, threads were executing that which means for each item that it was returning, it was concurrently calling this lambda. And it's not expected. I was expecting it to be serial, like one content item after the other, because this object is not thread safe. So we can't access the same instance multiple times. And this is per request. So if you have 10 threads that are accessing, or at least two threads 
are accessing during the same request this object there will be issues and in, in this case there were there were many transactions created with the same connection uh, associated to the session that's how we found the issue and apparently after digging into the source code of graphql um, how they work is that when they resolve a field they have strategies to resolve the fields and the default there are three different strategies you can set for simple queries for mutations and for subscriptions in graphql and the default one for um, queries which is our case was called parallel execution strategy and what it was doing well what it is doing it's just creating as many tasks in terms of uh, threading tasks and then uh, doing a wait for all and if you have multiple threads available then .NET will use multiple threads so the same request will be processed by multiple threads in this case and then there were multi-threading issues um, so the idea is that to create a custom document executor and to say for query we want serial execution so they are still asynchronous but one after the other and then we can't use session and this is yes, so what so was surprising is that it was a default behavior so anything that is not thread safe will fail and it's not obvious from the code that this thing will be called in parallel I uh, don't expect that uh, but as long as we know how it works then it's easy to fix it's kind of sad we can't define it per uh, resolver like I could say this one should be parallel can be parallel or should not be parallel things like this but that fixed the issue so that's good uh, fix x from Carl about I think yeah issues with a previous fix if you have questions don't hesitate to interrupt me um, more questions I prevent nested containers during setup step prevent nested containers um, this one might not be finished because your theory created a new PR to improve this change or actually to partially revert it not that it's not working but he found a better solution to what it's fixing so the issue we had a pre container during step step uh, what did we have yes um, The seed containers. Uh, oh, I didn't create an issue. This is a PR. Okay. Um, so the issue we had was that during setup, if I look at the diff here, during the setup, what we will do is we will create a fake, an empty scope with. So we will create a new container, a new DI container with a few modules that are enabled, like three modules, the three required modules to start the setup. So we create a fake tenant, say we need the recipe module, we need uh, the JavaScript module because the recipes need that, and something else, and that's it. And then with that we say, okay, let's resolve the recipe executor service and execute the recipe that the setup selected. But the recipe executor will itself create um, new DI containers okay um, for the new tenant and it will cr and it will then create new scopes for each of the steps like a new request but the issue we have when it creates a new container is that we already have an, an existing container to resolve a recipe con executor and then we create another container and in the case of SQLite it means or any other database it means we initialize two store objects which are supposed to be a singleton on each machine so if the databases don't support multiple connections to it or multiple things that are not supposed to happen multiple times then it will be an issue and it was an issue with um, the SQL store because uh, with the ID strategy it was not expecting two different threads from doing the same thing uh, one after the other or at least the first one was supposed to be disposed before the second one was started and it was not the case so there will be some conflicts and some id uh, conflicts so i fixed it by not requiring di to
to execute the recipe executor, which means the recipe executor can create containers. That's fine. It will be the only one created. Uh, and we don't need the i here because we know the lifetime of the object. We know all its dependencies, so we don't require the i. I think it was just easier to use the i before. At the same time, um, Chantiri made a PR that fixes the issue internally. So we can still use the i and we won't have the issue. So I will look at the other PR. Um, add admin attributes. So Spencer apparently requires that uh, because it's executed from the admin. It doesn't return a view, but it's a security feature for him to mark this one that should not be accessed from an end user. So we added that as a PR. Don't really understand why it's necessary or what he's doing with that, but it, it, it makes sense logically to, to have that. So I'm okay with that. So this is the PR I was talking about from uh, Jean Thierry. Then going back on dev branch, Jasmine. No, this is not the dev branch. The dev core is the dev branch. Okay, and this is just a guy who works the most function right now. So that's the dev branch, this, this one. So make I recipe executor. No, that's not it. Okay, that's this one. Fixing connection usage. Fixing connection usage. This is to react to a PR that was made uh, to fix the IDB connection accessor. Um, so I changed it to make it to make the previous implementation much simpler and try to handle less cases. Um, so what? So README first. So README just to explain how to use that. It's a new service. Uh, well, it was there, but the, the service has changed since then. So IDB connection accessor. So if you want to get a connection to do SQL queries by yourself, not using your SQL, and you like using Dapper, creating tables or custom queries, but you don't want to use SQL, you resolve that, and then you can create a new connection. That's all you can do. You can say, okay, give me a new connection. This way you can't mess up with existing connections by closing it while you are not supposed to close it, or creating transactions while, while there is already a transaction. You can just create a connection. Done. And it's your connection, you do whatever you want, you're responsible for the connection. So in this case, it's creating a new transaction and then and then it should commit the transaction. Oh, it's there, sorry. It's committing the transaction and returning the view. That's an example using Dapper. And it's also explaining um, how to use SQL dialect factory if you need that to create uh, multi multi database queries. Um, and then how to get the prefix for table names. Okay, um, so that's fixing it. And then what I did, I fixed. So I did that because the indexing task manager was very badly written by myself w uh, with regards to how it's hand handling the transactions and its collaboration with SQL. So now it's done better, and also it's paging the queries it's sending because um, someone, I think, I don't know, Jerome, I think, found that it was not paging correctly. It was send, it was doing the in statement uh, with too many IDs inside, so now it's paging. So that's fixed. So two bugs, one PR close, and an issue fixed. Um, Fixed connection is actually not supplying transaction during upgrade from beta 2. Then, because of this change, apparently it was breaking something else. So, um, Peter fixed it. I was not passing the transaction to the connection. Well, the transaction to this statement in Dapper that requires a transaction. So, he fixed it. This is the upgrade, automatic upgrade from beta 2 sites. Um, updating fluid because because crap what's his name Jeff Jeff found an issue with fluid he was trying to, he's trying to do weird things and the issue is that he was reusing uh, template context and by doing that uh, there were some dictionary entries already defined in this temp template context so I fixed it in fluid so it just updates the existing entries fixing stack overflow when displaying media. So, I th was it the client side stack overflow? 
but you just change the client side. I don't remember what um, Matthias did is just improve, uh, add a pager to the media so it doesn't render um, more than necessary items in the client. So if you have like hundreds of files in the same folder, now it will, well, it will still download the entries for this file, so it will explain what it does. Uh, it will return what it will display, but it will only download the files for the page that you, you asked for. Um, Bing. Okay, video video time. Okay, he didn't have a demo, but he's sending a video. I know, oh, we can't see at the bottom. Let me go down. Okay, pagers. I hope you can see. It's, it's a, v a GIF file in a Skype meeting. Okay, so it's not infinite scrolling, but at least it's pager. Good. Thank you, Matthias. Another one. Maybe for the other bug that fixes the pop up. Nope. I'm going down. Yeah, page also in the pop up media. Good. Almost done. What else? Updating SQL again. I must have spent too much time on that, on SQL, but at least it's better than ever. It's awesome. Um, so we still had some uh, database locking issues after the changes I made for Carl and for the index manager on the connections, and also for the DB, the ID generators. So we still had DB uh, lock issues. I'm not sure we don't have any more, but we can't repro any, any them anymore. Um, and, and we even fixed some that were not reported with Century. So this update is 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 a huge update on SQL. Um, there are new things, and that that impacts how a module should be developed in uh, Orchard. It doesn't impact whatever well any code that was written didn't have to change at all. That was good. You see, I just updated the, the versions. But when we deal with uh, SQL, we need to understand what's happening and to to use the good patterns. Let me let me show you. Um, let me show you what's new in SQL. SQL, just this thing. So if you go to session, what's new is that. Uh, we have a new method. So there used to be a commit async, and there is still a commit async. Okay? We'll go on the interface. So there used to be a commit async, and there is still a commit async here. But this commit async, you might never have seen it. And the idea is that when we resolve a session, um, we can call, we before, we would call commit async to flush the data to database, but then when a session is disposed, is disposed, the transaction will be committed. Now, there is still commit async, but it's not doing the same thing. Now, there is flush async, which is doing what commit async was doing. So, flush async flushes the data to database, okay, and doesn't commit because its name says so, it doesn't commit, but commit async was not committing either. That was an issue, actually. That was a bad naming. Uh, now, commit async commits the transaction to database. And if it hasn't been flushed, we flush also the data. So why do we have to? So what happens when we use a session in SQL? You call save, usually. And when you call save, it will assign an ID to the new object. And it will also, well, it mark, mark the object to be saved. And then once we call flush, it will compute all the, the changes it needs to do in a database for the indexes. 
like creating new map index, removing the old ones, creating reduce index, and all the things it needs to change the database for the, for the save to be applied. So it computes all the comments to send database and sends the command to database. So in the transaction that it's using, the changes are applied, but they are still in flight. They will be committed only when the transaction is committed, which is when you call commit async. Um, okay, and this commit async will also do a flush if it hasn't been called before. So if you don't call a flush async but just commit async, it will still flush and then commit the transaction. And 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 this commit async is also called automatically in the dispose method. So the session is disposable. So when a session is disposed, if you have not called cancel on the session, then it will issue a commit, which is itself will issue a flush async. Okay, and this is what we do by default in Orchard. By default, if you don't call, we never call commit async, we never call com flush async. Well, we usually don't call them. So if you don't call them, then disposing the session at the end of the request will commit all the changes to database by flushing and then committing your transaction. Okay. What we have, though, is um, a middleware for the HTTP request pipeline that will intercept uh, the fact that there is a session that has been resolved before the DI is resolved. So this middleware will call commit async automatically before this pause is called. So we do that for two reasons. Um, well, for one reason before and now for two reasons. Before we did that, so that we don't have to come to do commit async, it's just that, okay, so the session has been used, let's change change all the results to database. So we, don't, we, didn't, we didn't have to do that. It was one session per request and automatically, automatically committed. But now the, the second reason we do that is so that we can um, commit the transaction, because now it's committing a transaction when we call commit, not when it's disposed. So we, before the session is disposed, we call commit async in a middleware um, so that we close the transaction, we submit the transaction before any service is disposed. We have this issue, um, for instance, let me show you, in this commit I did for Jasmine's PR, this one. So this is some code I added to Jasmine's PR because when we will set up a site with his changes. So his change, you will see more, is using um, is now using an index provider, which is a scoped index provider during the setup. And we didn't have any case before that. And the scope service that it's using during the recipe was disposed before the session was disposed. But the session disposal will trigger some statement to be flushed in the database. And the session disposal using, well, and the flush using another service that was already disposed will cause an issue. Um, well, it's actually the other service that was calling into the, the session which was already disposed. So what we do now is before we go into dispose, we call commit so that there is nothing more to um, to do in the session before anything is disposed. So that that's the issue. So safe thing to do is when you have a controller that has an action that might spawn or that might span um, some logic into multiple services and multiple events. When you have a controller before returning the view, and if you are using the session, just call session .commit async, It will always be good. Worst case, you don't do that. The middleware will intercept that and do it for you. If it was already done, it won't have anything to do. That's fine. And then even worst case, then the dispose will do it for you. But we should not have to go into the dispose to do commit async. So maybe the next change I will do in SQL is to force um, the configuration so that it doesn't do it in the dispose. And it will throw an error saying, wait, you never called commit. There might be an issue you forgot to call the commit at, at some point. So we are explicit where we want the commit to happen. But it should not ideally happen in the dispose method. And that was the reason of this change um, that we can call commit or flush individually. There is still auto flush, which means if you do a select query and before you do a save, your SQL will flush the, the, the things into the current transaction so that your select query 
will see the data that has been flushed. Um, so and now everything is working fine. We can't find any any new looking issues. And some tests we did also with Janteri, um, which will remind some people here about Orchard One, uh, is that we try to go in the editor and. Uh, um, I opened uh, 10 editors on the same content type, 10 new items, and then I published all the items at the same time. And then we will see uh, DB lock issues, first for the ID generation and then for the commits uh, async issue. Um, and since this change, we, we can run as many parallel editions as we want, and there is no looking at all. So it's it's uh, super nice. In Orchard 1, we had issues like that, and it was uh, very hard to, to fix that by adding no logs on all the queries we want. And now we can do that even with the read, read uh, committed uh, mode, and it will work uh, super fine. So big change on SQL, but super um, nice uh, stability now with uh, looking. Um, talking too much, no questions, good. Uh, because we have demos after. Uh, then, then last change on dev, no, that was the last change on dev. Then we are good for demos. So demos we have Jasmine and we have David. And we'll start with David because alphabetical order. All right. All right, can you see my screen here? Almost. Fine, everyone can see. Okay, um, so I have been working on uh, Let's Encrypt uh, so that we can get uh, SSL certificates automatically. Um, so I added a uh, new menu over here for Let's Encrypt. Um, I, I've been working on the Azure uh, method of doing this. Um, uh, Castro stuff will come later. Uh, so I have uh, Azure authentication menu here in order to uh, make it so they can actually connect and uh, talk to the API to add the certificate and do the binding of the certificate. Um, so I have, you know, the basic settings. You got to set up uh, app registration, get your client seeker, and then you put that in and all this other information which if you've used the uh, site extension, this is the same stuff. So um, then there's this menu here where you can see a list of your bindings. Um, so right now I'm just loading all the host names out of Azure. Uh, I obviously need to change that because a child tenant should not be able to see all the host names. It should be based on what host names they are assigned. Um, but for now, uh, I'm on the default tenant, so I'm seeing everything. And also this Azure authentication, this only works on the default tenant. Um, so trial tenants will get the Azure auth uh, settings from the default tenant. Um, yeah, so I'm just listing this out. This is, this is pretty early. I'm still working on this. So this UI is probably gonna change significantly, but uh, <clears throat> So I, I can add my uh, my uh, host names I want to install cert for. Um, then I just got to put in my uh, email address for Let's Encrypt. And this will create a Let's Encrypt account for you, or it'll use one that you've already used before automatically. And I'm going to do staging because you only get five real ones per week. So what this is doing is it's doing the query of the account. Um, then it's asking Let's Encrypt to verify that I own these two host names by uh, making a call, uh, looking for a certain file. And then it installs, and then it gets a cert and installs it to Azure. So I now have a certificate here if I hit refresh in Azure. And then it also did the bindings. So now I have two bindings for those two host names here. So if I were to go to one of my domains, 
If I go HTTPS, and now I, I did the staging, so it's not a legit certificate, um, but normally it would be. And there's not there's not too much info yet, um, just because it's not a real one. But that's the idea. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it currently does not do renews. I gotta. I'm still working on that. There's like ten tasks I gotta do yet for this thing. But. So that's the first step to handle that in um, Azure with Azure Web Azure App Service. Yeah. Um, so just because I know how it works, because I've used it, and I'm sure most of us have used it. So what you, when you say request and certificate, it takes time because. It creates some files. It has to create some files in a local folder. Then you tell Let's Encrypt, hey, this is me. So go check the website, and you will find the files that you asked me to create. And so I own the domain. Where do you put these files? The Acme files, or the web? Uh, the, the I'm web putting web. them in the tenants folder inside Add Data right now. Good. Um, and they are served statically. Or yeah, you? and then I have. A, I just have an endpoint that goes and gets them and. And, uh, I see. I see. So you them. register a custom endpoint yep. to the dot well known whatever that they are requesting yes. for each tenant. So it's like slash tenant name slash dot well known. Yep. Good. Uh, which means we can have certificates for each tenant, and that makes sense because each tenant could have different domains. So in your Azure App Service, you can declare ten domains, one for each tenant. And each tenant can have their own Let's Encrypt certificates. OK, good. Makes sense. So it's available not just only in the default tenant, I assume? Yes. OK. Uh, I think I have a tenant if you want to see that, but ah, you don't trust me. Uh, no, I'm just wondering how it works. But then in terms of, so but you are on the default tenant here, but the settings for Let's Encrypt, are they in the default tenant? Maybe they should be the default. Well, maybe. Yeah, so this these settings are only in the default. Uh, this, I was letting the child tenant see it and, and run it, but I guess that's a decision to make. I don't know. Should the, should the, should the settings be defined in every tenant? I think maybe they should not have to because they are the same settings for all of the tenants, right? Because um, it's the same website, so that should be not... It's the same website, but different host names. So I was thinking that uh, the tenant would be the guy that sent out for their hosting. Yes, but but the settings, well, there is this page, and there is the Azure authentication. Yep. Azure authentication. This thing is common to everything. Yeah, this, this is common to everything, yep. Yeah, OK. And that might be interesting to not be able to set it from tenants. Maybe the owner of the default tenants or the infrastructure might want to be to configure it for every tenant to be able to get certificates. And that's super easy to do. Maybe you don't know that, but you can resolve the service of another tenant from yep. your subtenant. Yep. So maybe you could do that. Just allow this page only on the default tenant. And then okay. any tenant which has the module to generate the let's encrypt thing or the same feature maybe 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 even if it's the same feature you just don't show this this page for the subtenant just for the default tenant but the subtenant will have the certificates page here and they might just be able to to select the um, certificates for the domain that have been defined in the request host request url host of the tenant this way, you can't request domains that you're not the tenant for. Yeah, yeah, that was the idea. Good. I was trying to figure out: should the default tenant should he just see all the host names then for every tenant? Nah. Yeah. Well, the default tenant can always do everything. Yeah. Okay. But I, otherwise, I don't know what host name to really get for that. I see. So. Why? Well, well, yeah, I should. Okay. Or maybe everything could be done in a default tenant and done. And the subtenants can't do anything. I don't know. That would be, a, yeah, maybe just do it for the default tenant. After all. 
Um, yep. And then, so ultimately, so this is because you host everything in Azure App Service. So that's how you have to set up things up because it will set up. So how Azure App Service works in this case is your website runs um, by itself in Kestrel. No, does it run in IS in this case? Yes, it will run in IS. Um, but the bind, the SSL binding, I'm not sure if it's done at the ARR level before. Yeah, it's done at another level, at the, f at the first proxy level, ARR. Um, that's how it's configured in, in Azure. So that's why it can't be the current server from our uh, program.cs that um, hosts the SSL certificate. It's IS itself. So we have to configure IS with the certificate you got from Let's Encrypt. But then the next step is to also support um, local um, handling of the SSL certificates by our own services when it's not running in Azure App Services. Uh, I'm not sure how, yeah, it's harder. I don't know. Well, there is work to do because you need to configure that on a per request level um, by intercepting the request and saying, oh, this is dissonant, so this is your SSL certificate. But at the same time, you did the full ACME uh, exchange, so I think the hardest part is done, right? Yeah. I mean, well, it was already hard to do, I'm sure, understanding yeah, the protocol. Well, the problem is that the Azure uh, SDK that I was using, it seems to change often, and documentation ah. is not necessarily up to date. <laughs> okay. Well, that, not a guessing. the ACME protocol and also the creation of the certificate in Azure must have been hard because you need to configure everything. If you had everything locally without Azure App Service, there might be much less document uh, configuration to do because we just say, well, on the default tenant, that's all you need. And then you can create the folders where you want. You don't have to, yeah, you can store the certificates where you want. And that might be another issue where to store the certificate, but we'll see. That's good, good job. Yep. Um, and, and honestly, out of the, 10 sites I know running Orchard Core, only two of them are not using Azure App Services. So that's already covering 80% of the current market of Orchard Core I know of. Yeah, so and plus we're using Azure, so, you know. Yeah, it's for you also. Plus we're gonna be first with Azure. So are you using that now instead of the Excite extension that you get in Azure App Service? Uh, no, not on yet? any of any of these sites. Okay. This is just my test the domain I've got. At some point, I assume you will use that. Um, I did. Yeah, more likely. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, because the only issue I have with the default SAT extension is it's another SAT extension, so it's another site running on your site, and you need a web, st you need a storage account and a web jobs to be able to to get new certificates automatically. In the context of Fortran, we'll be able to run background tasks. That will be easier for us. So less services to run to, to get everything yep. set up. Um, and we yeah, the other advantage with that is like if we do the child tenant thing, the, the people that have a child tenant can manage this themselves mm -hmm. rather than yes. with the site extension, only the person that has access to the site extension can do this. Yes. So that's like a big advantage. Yeah, for SaaS, story, SaaS, SaaS uh, services, like if we look at tryorchard.net, we could just even say, okay, enable the feature and you can have your own, well, we will just have a default tenant to configure which domain is assigned to which site and let people have their own certificate. Or even have a feature that just configures it by default. As soon as you have a domain, you can just check, okay, give me a certificate and it will do everything for you, nothing to do. Test and yep. everything, yeah, that will be awesome. Awesome, great. Awesome. Thank you, David. So let us know how, it, um, how the progress is is doing, and if you need help and testers and everything, I'm sure people will have to test. We want to test it or use it already. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Cool. Uh, Jasper. Um, share my 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 screen. Yeah. Let me know when you see it, when you see it. Mm -hmm. Not yet. So you can see your screen. Matt can see, memory render, uh, just... Matthias also, okay, done, everyone can see. Okay, so I, I just added um, fields indexation. 
because uh, we had that in whole one and now I was needing to to be able to search per, per field for my website. So I'm just going to show you a quick example here. Um, I'm going to search for this string and it works. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but behind behind that I just um, I needed to do this here. So that's which is, work in um, English that you have to work in French. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's not uh, right now it's not even uh, taking in consideration if yeah. it's a string not even it's not even case sensitive or okay. anything. Yeah. It's based on database, okay. Yeah, it's based on um, the indexation, yeah, it's done in, on the da database uh, right now, and I think we we talk about uh, maybe eventually having something for doing this in um, Lucene too. But for now, um, the idea is that um, I want to change the filters here in the, in the admins, where we are searching for things here. Uh, I can search only for for the title of the content item, but if I have content I items that I have no title, I can't search for the, for any strings. So, yeah. so that's not the goal of Dispair. Dispair should not have anything to do with the admin filter. Okay? Yeah, yeah, also, but yeah. This will be another <laughs> PR. This will allow that, but this will be another PR. This PR is for indexing fields in SQL. Yeah, yeah. Just to explain to everyone, um, so as of today, when we want to do queries on the field data, then we have to use the Lucene queries because only Lucene is indexing the field content already. And Himanshu is the one who made most of the work. I did the first part and he improved all the indexes to, to store many more things and in many ways. So you could only use Lucene. So if you want to do a, a filter screen like he did on his homepage, to search for things, you will have to enable Lucene and to do a Lucene query um, to to find the, the thing. And it's totally supported, but you need Lucene to work and you need Lucene indexing to work. Um, but sometimes you need to do SQL queries because you have the data in SQL and it's easier. You don't want to use Lucene and it might be faster also, I don't know. Or, it, or it's easier for you to write SQL queries. But what we didn't have was um, all the field data inside tables that we can query. It's currently inside a JSON document, but not inside tables, projected in tables, so we can query them. So what Jasmine did is um, index providers, so that when we save a content item, it will extract all the field content into specific tables for each field. So each field will have its own index. So you can query anything that has a field of a type and a, a field name on a specific content type or a specific content part. So I had done that for taxonomies because it was necessary, and uh, but it could have been ex ex extended to any field, and that's what it did. So can you show us some code here? So we have here text field index provider, yeah. which means every time a content item will be saved by SQL, you will look in this content item if there is a field of type text, and for any field of type text on this content item, you will create a record in the text field index table with the values and two values here. So the, so the, you will see there is a rich text line 87 and a text line 97. So in this case, the idea is that if you're, this is specific to, for the text field. The, the text field will handle as a, any size of text. But in SQL, any size of text doesn't behave the same thing, the same way. You could have a, a NVAR char of a specified, uh, number like less than 4k or less than 1k of data and you could have unlimited text size which is the NVAR char max in SQL Server um, and they have different possibilities in SQL so when it's a fixed number of char you can do like queries but if it's a, a n text or NVAR char max you can't do like queries you can add full text and things like that but you can't do like queries so what what it's doing here is that if it's less than 4k, it's uh, setting it in the text um, field. Otherwise, if it's more than that, it's calling it the rich text, and then you can't do like queries anymore. 
so based on the content of the of the text. Maybe an idea will be to always store the content in both fields um, by doing a substring of 4K on the small one, and even if it's small, still uh, storing it in the rich text. So that based on the field you are querying, you know what kind of text it's inside, you can decide which one you want to query, the rich text or the text field. That's an idea. And, and we could also extend that every table, like you have a, you have a date time. Look at the, can you open the date time index? I'm just brainstorming uh, with everyone here, but right now in the date time index, I assume you have one field called the date time field, okay? Which stores the date time value. Good. What we could have also is more columns, like month, year, day, day of the week, so that you could even say, oh, give me all the values that are in this month. That might be super useful for, for specific queries. And then we don't have to compute that on the server side. It's just in the database already. So that might be interesting to, to do things like this for, for the fields where we can extract more data than just the data that, that we have. Um, we could do super useful um, scenarios with that. But now with it, with it, you can go in the SQL queries feature and do yeah. the queries you want and reference the fields. So the query might not be that super nice, but at least there is a way to do that because you have to join the the text field for the field you know that is a text field. Oh yeah, okay, let's look at your examples. Yeah, here is, I'm looking if I'm providing a description and I'm going to do just a if because I can do that with, with um, liquid syntax. And I'm just adding uh, the condition here on my SQL query, and I'm doing my like on the text field and text here for the description. This is super bad. Don't deploy that. I, I do. I do. In join here. There are lots of uh, SQL injection here. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Because description here is the parameter you pass, which is directly written in the in the SQL. Yeah. It will need to be a parameter, and I assume you can still bind a parameter with an add something. It should still work in this case. I think you can do like, and then I'm, uh, I have to check. Or we need a function, a filter that will um, escape SQL, like description pipe SQL escape. We need something like that. Do that please. Yep. Yeah, as part of your branch, because otherwise that's super bad here. Yeah, I know, but, but everything that comes from Liquid is, is a string, so... Yeah, um, but here's generating a SQL, okay, query. By doing that, if I ing if I type SQL in the description folder, in the description parameter, yeah, I will I be, you know, I will be able to inject SQL. If you do description pipe SQL escape, then I won't be able to. So that's, that's why we need a SQL escape filter. Or we need to use parameters which is supported in the SQL query, like the at description. But for the like, I'm not sure the add description will work. For the other ones, it will work. Like equals model, you can do equal add model instead. But yeah, SQL underscore escape will be what you need to do here. Um, yeah. Do we have this already or? No. That's no, we need to do that. Yeah, yeah. So as, as part of this branch, you can do a SQL escape filter. That would be nice. Okay. Or I will add it to, to your PR. That's fine. Yeah, it makes sense because um, else, it's always like that for every query that we, we have. Yeah, because, but, uh, but I don't think we need that. Like, apart from the likes, like when I look at line, uh, line, line, line 14, you see, you say condition equals and you inject the tag condition. Here, you can do equals arrobas condition instead of injecting the value condition. And in this case, it will use a SQL parameter which will be already escaped. So remove the double curly braces before, around. That's part of the language. Remove that and just put condition equals our base condition. Done. And that should work. And that is safe. We'll take we'll take, it, we'll take it offline and we'll see how it works. But that yeah, works. yeah, I didn't know that we could do that. But yeah, it makes sense. But is it, it's still going to be a string there, and I can inject whatever I want no. as a string. No, I don't there. agree. I don't agree. That's what I'm saying. By doing a NAT, it will mm -hmm. escape everything for you. Okay. Yeah. Because it's using uh, something else. Because uh, internally, the lines. and it's not yeah, internally. 
it will use the actual SQL parameter object internally. Yeah. So it will be escaped, and it will reuse the same query again and again, which means it will be more performant. It will send the same query to SQL Server with parameters, instead of sending new queries with different values that SQL Server will have to parse and evaluate. So that's better and safer. We'll, we'll look at that offline to see all the the, the 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 scenarios that we should handle in this case. That's that's a I, I think it's something else that that goes with yeah, the queries there. Yeah. But that's that, that's super nice. So so looking at what you did, so content field equals the name of the field. Or the, okay, so here you are looking for, and that's nice because they are the same. You have multiple fields of the same type, so you can do that in the same query. And yes. text field index dot text likes. Okay. I'm just heading the fields that I want to be able to search for, and they're all like there. So I'm just filtering by the content field here, so that I can change search per inventory or just the description here or the model of 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 uh, the machinery. Okay, good. I think we can do this here, but. Um, I wanted to do that uh, direct. We can also do that directly with. Um, I mean, I could have done that directly by uh, indexing this right here, uh, because I have my own index of four machinery. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. Another way, if you want, if you can do this coding, is, yeah, you can. Yeah, do this your is own. more generic. Yeah, this is more generic. Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's it. Thanks <laughs> a lot. Questions for Jasmine or for David? David. Cool. Then I think we are there. Very nice demos. Thanks a lot. Um, and that concludes the meeting. If you have no other questions, then I'll see you next Tuesday or on Thursday for the triage. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.